Today we're going to do a video called Bible or Counsel. And uh, there's going to be a little bit of a jumping back and forth uh, that is going to be involved in this video. So you might want to pull out your Bible, uh, look up and follow along with some of the uh, verses that I'm going to go over. Because it is going to kind of bounce back and forth a little bit. Um, I'm going to try to keep it, um, the subject, together uh, as well as I can. Uh, it's it's more about three different topics here. Um, that your, your authority, and this is more of a theological video. Um, and there's other videos that relate to this as well that would I would probably highly recommend that you uh, watch. Uh, Why the Jews Reject Jesus. Uh, also, Seven False Doctrines is another one that kind of relates to this video in some respects. But this is more, again, this is more of a theological video, which I haven't done a lot of those. Um, so what this video is going to detail is, and this is why it's called Bible or Counsel, um, you really can't accept both. Um, either you accept the teachings of the Bible. Uh, when I say Bible, I'm more referring to the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, or you must accept the, the teachings of the Council of Nicaea and what the uh, council um, tried to progress uh, their teachings that they tried to implement. Um, you, you pretty much have to accept one or the other because once you learn how all of this came about and what was going on, you really can't accept both. Uh, only one of them really can be your foundation. And this is why the Jews don't accept uh, what the Christians have, have tried to to pour out on 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 everybody, they 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 look at the Hebrew scriptures, and this is what the different the main difference I've noticed between Jews and Christians. Jews will use the Hebrew scriptures as their foundation. Anything that does not align with what the Hebrew scriptures promotes and what it says and what uh, what it, it commands, they they toss away. Okay, Christians tend to go the other way around. They'll look at it from the top down. They will already use the premise that Christianity is true. Jesus is the, the son of God, <clears throat> the circular argument fallacy. And what they'll do is because they have that premise, they will read Jesus into the uh, Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. Okay. Instead of doing it the other way around and allowing the Hebrew scriptures to be the truth. And then going off of what anything else says has to align with what the Hebrew scripture says. That's really the only difference between a Jew and a Christian. Okay. Is Christianity is tries, tries to fit in an idea. Um, and they try to read it into the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, as we're going to notice, um, almost none of it fits. And then we're going to see the frauds that were also done with it as well. But this isn't even really about frauds. This isn't about... Uh, corruption. I mean, we're going to see a little bit of that in here, but this is this. A lot of this should be eye-opening for you if you are indeed a Christian. So let's uh, let's take a look at a couple uh, um, of these. And by the time we're done with this video, again, you almost are forced to have to either choose the. If you're going to be uh, if you're going to be a theist uh, of one of the Abrahamic religions, you're going to have to either accept the Bible or accept the Council of Nicaea. Uh, because those are the two different com uh, 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 competitors here. It does not align whatsoever. They're, they're alien to each other. They're contradictory to each other. They do not agree uh, the least bit. Uh, the first one we're going to go over here is I want to uh, show you here. Let's let's start here. Let's, let's make we sure we establish this. I don't think this is going to be an argument. Take a look at Hebrews 10.18. It says, and when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. Because let's get this out of the way real quick. This is going to be agreed upon by every Christian. Because this is the main theology of Christianity. Jesus was perfect. No matter, what you, no matter how you identify Jesus, whether he was a man, whether he was God, whether he was God in the flesh, whether the Spirit of God dwelt within him, however you want to identify him is, is irrelevant here. However you look at it, Jesus was perfect. Jesus was sinless. Jesus was spotless. Absolutely perfect. From, from No sin is found in him. Okay, This is identified all over the New Testament. This is a main theology again in Christianity. No argument there. There's absolutely no argument there. Okay, Now we have that understanding. I want you to 
take a look at Ezekiel chapter 45, in particular 4522. Before I read this verse, understand that Ezekiel 45 and in the, ch the chapters leading up to this, it's talking about the future last days in the third temple. Christians agree with this. Jews agree with this. It is blatantly said in the text. Um, so this is not an argument. Again, this is talking about the future third temple, the future uh, last days. And the only argument here is who is this individual? Okay. Um, that is in, in, in charge, basically, of this last time. I want to read uh, Ezekiel 45, 22 here, and then we'll kind of go over it. It says, On that day, the prince is to provide a bull as a sin offering for himself and for all the people of the land. Okay, so in Christianity, this prince is Jesus. Okay, Jesus has returned. Uh, this is the, the, the end of the last days. And this is talking about, of course, the third temple, okay? And before you say, well, maybe the prince is not Jesus, and we'll get into this in a minute. If you look at Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 9, or chapter 9, 25 through 27, it talks about the Messiah, the prince. And it's talking about, uh, in Christian theology, it's talking about the supposed prediction of the death of the Messiah prince. And of course, this is Jesus, okay? So the prince is Jesus in Christian theology, but in reality, it's not. But let's assume for a minute that it is. Let's assume for a minute that it is. Again, there's no argument that Ezekiel 45 is talking about a future last day, the third temple. No argument. No argument, again, that Jesus is sinless and spotless in Christian theology. No argument there. Then why in the world is Jesus, the prince, Offering a bull for for himself as a sin offering. This really refutes this idea. And if you're going to again try to wiggle out of like, well, maybe Jesus isn't the prince here. Well, that's not going to work because again, in Daniel chapter nine, it's talking about the prince, which Christians uh, implore is as Jesus. So you can't you can't cherry pick. You can't pick and choose here. And then again, if it ain't Jesus, who is it in Christian theology? Now in Jewish theology, this prince is 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 remember the 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 Messiah, the Mashiach in, in Judaism is a future king that the uh, the Hebrew scriptures uh, prophesy about. Is not a demigod. It's not like Jesus, born of a father god, mortal mother. Is he's not perfection without sin. He didn't die for your sins as a sacrifice. None, none of that is, is foretold in the Hebrew Scriptures. The prince, the Messiah in <clears throat> Judaism is a normal human being, uh, born of normal human parents, has, you know, has sinned just like everybody else. All right? He's a leader. He, he's, like, he's like that of David. Now, actually, in the Hebrew Scriptures, it says the Messiah's name will be David. But... Besides that point, that's who the prince is in Judaism. That's the Messiah figure. They don't need the Messiah to be sinless and spotless. Christianity does. So again, we go back here to Ezekiel 45, 22. This prince, Jesus, offers a bull for a sin offering for himself and for the people. But why would he offer a sin offering for himself if he's without sin? Not only that, but also he's offering a bull. Why not a lamb? It, 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 none of it, once you really look into it, none of it works. None of it matches. This is a, this is a huge problem. This is a massive problem because now you're kind of stuck. If you're a Christian, you're, you're stuck here because you can't say that this prince is not Jesus because then that goes against what you want Daniel 9 to be. And it goes against your entire theology. But if you accept that this prince is Jesus, which is what Christians believe, then why is he offering a bull for a sin offering? Guys, something isn't right. Something is wrong there. This, the, 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 and we're going to notice this here shortly that it even gets worse, way worse. But let's take it one step at a time. Why would a perfect, sinless Jesus be offering a sin offering of a bull for himself? He's without sin. It, 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 the theological acrobatic moves that you have to make to try to make this fit is is almost laughably uh, uh, um, horrid on, on every level. 
Not only that, too, but you also look at the other part of this. There's animal sacrifice. Now, we obviously don't have animal sacrifice today. This ended in 70 CE when the temple was destroyed. You know, so, but here's the thing. And a lot of Christians, not, not, not all of them, but a lot of them, believe that the animal sacrifice will be brought back in the end times. I have heard that in some theologies. There's other Christians that believe that it won't be. Well, this forces you to have to believe that animal sacrifice will also be back in the end times. But do know, in the Hebrew Scriptures, it doesn't say anywhere that the animal sacrifice will, will cease and then begin again, right? It does In Daniel chapter 9, it says that animal sacrifice will cease, all right? And that's going to become very, very interesting here in just a few minutes. But again, let's take a one step at a time. But the bigger problem, it isn't the animal sacrifice in the last days. You can wiggle out of that if you try to, to uh, bend and stretch some verses as much as you need. But the one thing you can't do is come to any kind of understanding of why in the world is the prince, which again in Christian theology has to be Jesus, because they have to admit it's Jesus, because who else is it going to be, first of all? But second of all, they need the prince to align with, with other areas like Daniel chapter 9. And this is a future event in the last days, the third temple, as everyone agrees upon that. Why is he, Jesus, the prince in their theology, offering a bull for sin offering for himself? He's without sin. This can't be Jesus, is what I'm trying to say. Something's wrong there. Let's go to the next one, though. Uh, you, I, I want to read the, the New Testament uh, claim here first, because uh, this is a big one. All right. Take a look at Hebrews 9.22. It says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So the author of Hebrews here, which we really don't have any idea who actually wrote it, vividly makes it unequivocally clear that it without blood, there is no remission of sin, okay? It, it, you have to have blood to for, for sin to be forgiven. The, he makes this, it makes this crystal, crystal clear. And he's getting this uh, from Leviticus 17.11 is where this author is uh, somewhat quoting this. The problem is <clears throat> Christians don't read chapter 17 of Leviticus. They'll just go straight to Leviticus 17, 11, read that one verse, and it, well, yeah, it kind of sounds like that. The problem is, is they don't read the entire chapter. And actually, you don't even need to read, read the entire chapter. You just got to read the verse before it. But Leviticus 17 is an entire chapter dedicated to the warning that the Israelites or a sojourner among them shall not eat blood. This was an abomination to God, okay? You you cannot eat blood. That's what this whole chapter is talking about. I want to read Leviticus uh, Leviticus 17, 10 through 12. Now, do note the author of Hebrews gets this from 17, 11, so sandwich right in between it. Let's start at 17, 10. It says, I will set my face against any Israelite or any foreigner residing among them who eat blood, and I'll cut them off from the people. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make an atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is a blood that makes an atonement for one's life. Therefore I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any foreigner residing among you eat blood. Okay, so did you see what happened here? If you go back to Hebrews here, it says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Notice in the 1711, it doesn't say that. Again, in 1711, it says, I have given it to you to make an atonement for yourselves on the altar that makes an atonement for one's life. It makes an atonement for you. What, it, what this is saying here, if you read Leviticus 17, again, to start with 1710, this is a warning from the Hebrew God that blood is forbidden to be eaten. That's the whole purpose of this chapter is to not eat the blood that you, an Israelite or a sojourner. Eating blood is an abomination. The only purpose the blood has, because it's not to be eaten, is to be an atonement for one's soul. Notice it's a, an atonement. It, it, it's, not the, it's, it's not without blood there's no remission of sin. This is a way for sin to be forgiven. Well, what kind of sin? 
I mean, it, it, all sins? We need to clarify this. Please read Leviticus chapter 4. The blood sacrifice for the Israelites was for one purpose and one purpose only. It was for an atonement for unknowing sins. It was sins out of ignorance. That's the only time they used the blood sacrifice. If one reads Leviticus chapter 4, read that in context, the whole chapter. It is only through the blood, uh, the, the, the sin atonement of blood was only for unknowing sins, sins out of ignorance. If you committed sins that you know you've done wrong and you do it anyways, and you committed sin, guess what? Blood's not going to do you a lick of good. That's why Ezekiel chapter 18 has no blood in it. It has no human sacrifice in it. It is simply repent and turn back to the laws of God. That's how you are forgiven, according to Ezekiel 18, okay, and in other places too. But the blood was not meant to be an, a, a remission of all sins. But again, I want to read one more time. Just make sure we have it crystal clear. Hebrews 9.22, he says, Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. Here's a point here. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That is a lie. How do you change the Bible? How do you change the text? The author of Hebrews just absolutely adds to the text here that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That is not what Leviticus 17.11 says, and that is not what the chapter 17 of Leviticus says. It actually that contradicts what Leviticus 4 says. It does not say that in the Hebrew Scriptures. It, it says in the Hebrew Scriptures, Leviticus 4, Leviticus 4 Blood is used for unknowing sins, sins out of ignorance. It does not say without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That is a lie. That is a fraud. This was text because the author of Hebrews, well, the other places do, but the author of Hebrews was very adamant about this idea. There's more fraud in Hebrews than in most books. He was very, whoever it was, was very adamant about saying, you know what? The Jews had the covenant. They broke the covenant. Now that God has disregarded them, they, they are tossed aside. And now it's us Christians that own the covenant. Okay? That was the whole theme of the book of Hebrews. If you remember the, uh, I believe it's in the ninth chapter of Hebrews. And I go over this in another video where uh, the author says that when the children of Israel broke the covenant, uh, God disregarded them. Okay, this is quoted from Jeremiah chapter 31. Is another place where the author of Hebrews commits fraud. Does it say that in Jeremiah 31? That is a lie. He says that um, the children of Israel broke the covenant and God disregarded them. Please look this up on your own. You go to Jeremiah chapter 31, right about the middle of the chapter. The author of or Jeremiah says here that when the children of Israel broke the covenant, Although I was a husband unto them. There are other areas, and I go over this in my book. God promises to never abandon the Israelites, to never disregard them. The author of Hebrews wants them disregarded because they want the Christians now. Because this was, again, it's either the Bible or the Council of Nicaea. You can't have both. But we see the fraud there. But again, blood is an atonement for the children of Israel, according to the Tanakh more of the Torah, but it is only for unknowing sins. Please read Leviticus chapter 4. But this author of Hebrews quotes here from Leviticus 17.11. 17.11 doesn't say that. It does not say without blood there is no remission. It actually says quite the opposite of that. Now the next one uh, I want to go over here is going to be about Daniel chapter 9. It's, it's so important. Uh, so very important. I go over this uh, in my other video called Prophecies. I'll go over it in a little bit more detail. Mainly, I want to concentrate on Daniel 9.25. Let's, let's read this here. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Okay, so this is Jesus, right? Every Christian, this they love Daniel 9, 25 through 27. They love this. But only if they knew the problems that persisted with this. Okay, let's 
let's make sure we understand the context here before we get into it. If you go back to the beginning of Daniel chapter 9, what's going on here? Daniel doesn't understand the prophecy that Jeremiah gave. He's confused. He doesn't, he doesn't understand the prophecy. He doesn't understand what's going on in his own time. He's just kind of lost. So in this story, Angel Gabriel visits Daniel and kind of tells him what this prophecy meant, how this, what this prophecy detailed. Okay, so let's read uh, two verses here from Jeremiah. If you look at Jeremiah 25, 12, and these are really the two main verses that, that the Gabriel would supposedly kind of, of instruct Daniel because this was a prophecy Daniel didn't understand out of Jeremiah. Okay, so look at Jeremiah 25, 12. It says, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans <clears throat> will make it perpetual desolations. And the other one in Jeremiah is Jeremiah 29, 10. It says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years will be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you to return to this place. Okay, so that's, that's the context here. The, the, the whole idea here is Gabriel is, is explaining to Daniel what Jeremiah prophesied about because Daniel wasn't quite getting it. Uh, that's the, the, the whole point of this is he didn't quite understand what this prophecy entailed. All right. So <clears throat> when we take a look at that, now let's, let's go, I, I want to understand something. This 490 years that is talked about, if you read Daniel 9, 25 to 27, the 70 times seven Christians will try to, I I've heard probably hundreds at least, <clears throat> Different time periods. Okay, the, the clock starts here. Clock starts here. But then, then it, 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 it doesn't count over here. And it starts again over here. The, the acrobatic moves that you must make to make this 490 years work is absolutely laughable. Uh, because the reason why it doesn't work is because it's not talking about Jesus. It has nothing at all to do with the future Jesus. And I'm, I'm going to prove that to you. Okay, but the clock started with Babylon, kind of like the text in Jeremiah says. If you read the text I just quoted in Jeremiah, it's talking about visiting Babylon and the Chaldeans. That's when the clock started, was before Daniel and in the time of Babylon. <clears throat> but I want to prove to you that this, this Messiah, the prince, is not Jesus. Okay, let's read some verses here. Uh, actually, before I read these verses, I want to explain one little thing to you. If you open up your Bible today and you pull it and you and you open up to Daniel, okay, and you finish reading Daniel, go to the next book and the next book. Did you know in the Hebrew order? Remember, that's the order of the church, the Council of Nicaea, or that time period. That's the order they put it in for you. Do you know what book is right after Daniel in the Hebrew order? Ezra. Ezra in the in the Christian version. Ezra is far removed from Daniel, and that is important. They did this intentionally because if you if you ended Daniel and you went straight into Ezra, you would find out who this 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 Messiah prince is, and it's Cyrus, king of Persia. And that's why the Christian Church removed Ezra and put it several books away from Daniel because that way you wouldn't be able to connect those dots, so to speak. But let's prove that this Cyrus is uh, is the king of uh, uh, Persia. <clears throat> biggest one here is, uh, we'll actually start with Ezra, because I just mentioned that one here. Let's just took that at the first two verses of Ezra 1.1 1, 1 and 1.2. 1, Remember, this follows right after the book of Daniel, okay? In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. The, you know, and right there, remember those two verses I gave you from Jeremiah? Remember that. That was the prophecy that Daniel didn't quite understand. You follow along here? So in Ezra 1.1 here, already in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, this was going to be Cyrus, king of Persia. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth 
and has, and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. <clears throat> this is why Ezra is not right after Daniel. <clears throat> because if you were to finish Daniel and go straight to Ezra, you would uh, connect the dots here and see that Daniel 9 is talking about Cyrus. If you're not convinced yet, but before we go to the next one here, look what that said again. It was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet Jeremiah. Remember those two verses in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 10 and Jeremiah 25, 12. These were, this is what Daniel didn't understand. Gabriel was explaining to Daniel what this prophecy entailed. And it was about Cyrus, king of Persia here. Okay, so there's Ezra 1, 1 and 1, 2. Well, I want to really confirm this. Let's read Isaiah 44, 28 through 45, 1. This is two verses, okay? Very important. Follow along here. Remember, uh, and actually before I read this, let's read 925 of Daniel one more time just to make sure we understand. What does 925 of Daniel say again? Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, that's Babylon, don't forget, to restore and to build Jerusalem, mainly the temple, we're talking about the temple, unto the Messiah. The prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Okay, so make sure you remember that. Let's go to Isaiah now. Isaiah 44, 28 uh, through 45, 1. Here we go. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, prince, and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. That's the second temple. That's what we're talking about here in Daniel 9.25. And of the temple, let its foundation be laid. Pause right there. That's just verse 44. Again, this is talking about the Messiah, the prince. He is my shepherd. Okay. Well, Josh, it didn't say Messiah there, did it? Let's keep going. Isaiah 45.1. This is what the Lord says to his anointed Messiah to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue the nations before him and to strip kings of their armor to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. This verse in 9 to actually Daniel 9 25 through 27 is talking about Cyrus, king of Persia. Look all these up for yourself. Again, uh, just to, to conclude that, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything here either, because this is so very important uh, to, to understand. Again, also read uh, 9, 26, and 27 in Daniel as well. Um, and one other, one other thing, if you read Daniel 9, 20, let's say 25 through 27, it also says that the Messiah will be killed, right? In probably your translation. Do note in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word does not mean killed. I, for, I, I always forget what that word is. But the word used in Hebrew does not mean killed. There's actually another Hebrew word that means killed. The Hebrew word there does not say that he will be killed. It means that he will be cut off, meaning that it, it will, the Hebrew word used means that he could, he, he could be removed from office, uh, disregarded, thrown aside. It does not mean killed, all right? That's very important to understand that the Hebrew word used there was not killed, okay? I just want to make sure you clear that up for you. And also here, if all of this does not convince you, if all of this does not convince you, I want to really convince this to you. This, These three verses, Daniel 9, 25 through 27, is heavily used today by Christians. If this was truly a prophecy about a future Jesus and his death, how amazing would that be? That would be the most remarkable prophecy ever. Did you know that nowhere in the New Testament, no author of the New Testament, Gospels, Epistles of Paul, other letters, Revelation, nowhere, mentions this fulfillment of the prophecy? Isn't that amazing? That lets you know that it wasn't, it didn't go through Christology yet. This all happened late in the second century when the massaging of the text occurred. And later Christians saw these verses, especially once they were massaged, and calculated to mean Jesus. Isn't that odd? It's common sense. 
if this was accurate and true, was really talking about Jesus, how could no New Testament author ever mention this verse? They never once did. They, they mention all kinds of other supposed prophecies that are so almost irrelevant. But this one here, that prophesied of the death of the Messiah and Jesus was never mentioned in the New Testament. That shows you something is wrong there. Also, the M and the P for Messiah and Prince were capitalized in the translation. There are no capital letters in the Hebrew language. That shows something is wrong. Somebody intentionally uh, capitalized those letters. The word Messiah used 39 times in the Old Testament, and only here is it actually capitalized. That shows you the Christology that happened. Um, and, and I want to finalize this on one last thing, if you still don't believe me, even though I've proven it to you with verses and common sense as well. But if you read a quote by Origen, Origen was an early church father around the year 200 CE, one of the most famed church fathers to ever live. And he made a famous quote in 200 CE he said, either to the carelessness of the scribes or the audacity of the scribes, they would change and delete the text as they please. That should tell you all you need to know. And what the early Christians did, once they could, more or less when they gained power at the Council of Nicaea, they wouldn't, they wouldn't change a lot of the Hebrew scriptures. But what they do, they would massage the text. A little pronoun change. They would change from uh, past tense to future tense in a lot of areas. And it would make it fit. Again, if that Daniel 9 was talking about Jesus, which, again, all you have to do is read Isaiah 44, 28 through 45, 1. Read the first two chapters of Ezra and quote those two verses from Jeremiah. Completely shatters that idea. It's talking about Cyrus, king of Persia. But if it was talking about Jesus, how could no New Testament author ever mention this verse? That would be nearly impossible. At the end of the day, guys, again, you have to either choose, if you're going to be a theist and believe in the Bible, you all, you have to choose either the Bible or the council because the Bible is in strict contradiction to what the council tried to progress. Christianity, what they tried to progress, does not fit what the Bible says. You can, again, watch my other video, Seven False Doctrines. There is a reason that Jews do not accept the advancement of Christianity. Because it, it, the same reason you as a Christian don't accept the advancement of Mormonism, where they did the same exact thing the Christians did to the Jews, for the same exact reasons, under the same exact evidence. But again, I, I urge you to watch my other video series, Seven False Doctrines, for a little bit more on that. All right, guys, hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you'll reach me. Until next time, thank you very much.